Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed. They've given it everything on the global bucket. Oh, yeah! Oh! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello, fans of Shuklistan, and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you? Hello. I have a very quick little story I do want to tell you. Okay. So last night, I had a lot of trouble sleeping, but I did sleep. And one of the reasons I had a lot of trouble sleeping was because I had some very weird dreams. I had a dream that 2030 got awarded to Vancouver. But not Vancouver, Vancouver and Vancouver, like a cross-country joint bid, which like was great. Vancouver, Washington and Vancouver, British Columbia? Yes, which actually is kind of an interesting thought. But here's the thing. So we were there and we had to go from one Vancouver to the other Vancouver, which you think would be a plane, a train, a ferry. No, it was a roller coaster. And the <laughs> roller coaster, wait, it gets better. The roller coaster went underwater. Oh. <gasps> And can I just say, in my dream, you handled it like a pro. I was a disaster. I was literally <laughs> hanging on by the straps and I was being flung out of the roller coaster <laughs> underwater. <laughs> and you were in the car ahead of me just editing the show <laughs> on the underwater roller coaster. I love but wait, it. wait, there's, there's another element to this. So as the roller coaster is going through, we were knocking children out of the path of the roller coaster. But here's the best part. When the roller coaster pulled into the second Vancouver, it was the Beijing volunteers who were helping us get out of the roller coaster. So just a thought for people doing joint city bids, possibly a waterbound roller coaster could answer your transportation needs. I love it. I love roller coasters. This sounds fantastic to me. The 2030 Express. All right. <laughs> Since we're talking bids today. Right. We are uh, talking once again with Terrence Burns. We had him on last week and we've got him on again this week to talk about the history or what they call the golden age of Olympic bids. Terrence is the owner, chairman, and CEO of T. Burns Sports Group, LLC, which does sports marketing, sponsorship, sales, and negotiation and strategy, bidding, advisory services, and brand and communications development. We talked about sponsorship last week. This week, we're talking bids. Terrence has worked on a number of Olympic bids, both successful and unsuccessful, as well as some World Cup bids. So in this interview, we wanted to note that Terrence mentioned Terrence mentions George several times, and that George is referenced to George Herthler, who spoke with us on episode 247. So if you haven't gotten that listened to yet, you, you might want to go back and check it out. Take a listen. Speaking of new norm, let's well, talk bids. Okay, let's go to bidding. Bids, okay. You have worked I on a ton of bids. 13 or 14 Olympic bids, two World Cup bids, a couple World Championship bids presidential bids so how do you just golf wrestling specifically for the olympic bids who to work with boy everybody asked me that <laughs> honestly they come to me i mean there's no way to market that what do you do put an ad in around the rings or no i mean it, you just don't and it's just because i've been in this so long that i know a lot of people you know and there have been a few cycles where it was a tough decision you know, and I was a small businessman and I still am. I've had two or three companies to do that bit work and now it's me. I am the company. I'm just at a point where I don't want to build an agency anymore and be responsible for 50 people's lives and constantly chasing revenue. And I loved all that, but there's a time and place for everything. I'm not 40 anymore. And a lot of that in the early days, brutally honest with you, is revenue driven. What's the best deal I could get? You know, I didn't want to take a city that I thought had zero chance. But I've done it because well, it's I, example. Know, Doha 2016. I just finished Sochi. We just finished the, uh, the final presentations. We had just won Guatemala City. 
everybody thought I was a nut for taking Sochi. And that's a long story too, but we had just finished and we're kind of in the catbird seat for bidding assignments, which thank goodness more often than not, I have been. Then I met with them and they were very nice. And they said, we're going to bid on 2016. I said, you don't have a chance. You just don't have a chance politically, operationally. Well, we want you to do it. And I could see they were sincere. And I could see that they had no idea why they couldn't win. There was a couple of people that were Qataris that I was dealing with, but the people with whom I was dealing with directly in the deal were British expats who were construction people. But in those days, the Arabs and the Qataris in particular, they had trusted people with whom they had done business before. And this gentleman that I was talking to had built the first Western hotel in Qatar. And it had been there way before the onslaught of Western consultants rushing there to milk them out of money, which is typically what happens in, in the Middle East. They're wising up to that. They're not an ATM anymore for consultants, which is good. But I'm dealing with a guy who, not a sports guy, not an Olympics guy, but he's just somebody they trust. And that made it hard, really hard. But it was a financial decision for me. Sat down, I looked at what the opportunities were, and I said, okay, you know, I, in those days, if you recall, there was an application phase and a candidature phase. Application phase, you had to write a mini bid book. And if you went through that, you write the bid bid book. So I structured the deal. I structured all of my deals in those days. If you don't make it past the applicant phase, you owe me half of the entire contract because I can't work for another city. Well, that proved to be wrong later on in the process. I think for 2020, I worked for Rome, Baku, and then Madrid. I think those were the three I did for 2020. So that's an example of one where, frankly, the financial upside was strong and, and extraordinarily strong compared to the other opportunities. And I took it and I knew that they weren't going to make it. I wasn't particularly interested in working for Rio. And I can't remember who else was in 16. Oh, well, Istanbul has been in all of them, it seems like. So yeah, that's an example where it was a financial decision. You know, we had a small company, had a lot of people, cash flow was king. And I needed a 12 month solid cash flow that could go into 24 months if it makes it through. But even if it didn't, it was a good payoff. Didn't mean that I didn't work my butt off for them. I, we did. I still have that applicant file we wrote somewhere. We were doing the best of what we had to work with. Other ones, honestly, let's just go quickly through it sequentially and it'll maybe help focus my mind. Beijing, I was working with George on that one. And the reality is we got a call from a third party who wanted us to help the last six months of the campaign, the reality was the IOC was going to pick them anyway. And the Chinese were terrible at communications, international communications, especially, you know, so the, the subtitle on that was they're going to win anyway, but so let's make it look good. So they hired us and we kind of rejigged their messaging, George and I, and worked on their presentation. It was still pretty nascent stuff in those days. I remember teaching the mayor of Beijing to give a a minute and a half speech in phonetic English. He had no idea what he was saying. He was looking at Chinese characters that made the sound of English. And I've done that with the mayor of Beijing, the mayor of Moscow, sports minister of Russia, Mutko. They had no idea what they were saying. They just were saying the words, reading the Russian or the Chinese or whatever. And it made the sound that sounded like an English word. And then you could check the box. Boy, see, we gave a speech in English, vote for us. Then Vancouver called us. I had cracked a knee or broken my ankle. So George had to go up there, close the deal. We worked for them. 9-11 happened, killed our business. I went away and worked for NASCAR for a year, went out in the desert, kind of like Jesus, came back, tempted by the devil. NASCAR is fantastic product, great people. George Pine, I met, and I still have a relationship with George, but the product wasn't me. Yeah, I just didn't, I didn't get NASCAR and a lot of people do, but I didn't. So I came back, I got a call from Frank Craig Hill, who started Advantage, which became Octagon. And Frank said, I've got a call from a friend in Moscow who has gotten, no, he's in Beijing, Ivan Brixey, and somehow Octagon has gotten the contract for the Moscow 2012 Olympic bid, but they don't know anything about bidding. So they wanted me to call you. It had happened at a perfect time because I was trying to get out of NASCAR and here's a, just a golden opportunity. And I had, I'd moved to Moscow in 1992, right after the fall of the Soviet Union with Delta. So I was familiar, very familiar with Russia. 
but that's the first time I've been back in five or six years. Moscow 2012 proved to be the worst professional experience of my life. I still love Russian people. They were good people. The guy running it probably wasn't in it to win it. Budgets mysteriously vanished. Putin wasn't really behind it. The government wasn't really behind it. It was a NAS. It was a, it was a Moscow led initiative, kind of hapless and amateurish on their side, but I did it and I worked really hard, tried to do it right. And the Russians to their credit, when it was over, they said, we think you believed in this bid more than we did. And you worked really hard and we're not going to give up. We're going to, we're going to bid for the winter games in 14. And by then I had already visited the Jormy in Georgia. That's an out that wasn't going to work. Salzburg. I think I had an issue with the guy running it. He'd never done a bid in his life. And no, and he said, there's nothing you can tell me about bidding. I don't know. So I said, well, we're not going to work well together. So yeah. So the Russians gave me that and it was a blank piece of paper. And that was in August of 05. And I hired Bob Stiles, who's on the venue side, Charlie Battle, hired designer, David Woodward, hired two or three consultants. And we wrote the mini bid book. We did it. There was no bid committee. I had no contract. I spent about 400 grand of my company's money. So from August, and then in November, I got a call and it said, a guy named Dmitry Chernyshenko is the new CEO of Sochi Bid, and he's going to call you. And you need to know that he's going to fire you and he's going to hire IMG because they're here and they say they can do all of this, that he doesn't need Helios, which was my company. I said, okay. I was leaving Australia, going to London. So I had to stop in Dubai. So I got in Dubai, I had a voicemail from Dima and I called him back and uh, he said, I understand you have my bid. I said, I have a bid. It's not your bid. Right now it's my bid and it's done and it's in French and it's in English. It's designed all the venues done, but I don't have a contract. I haven't been paid for this. And I understand you're going to fire me and hire IMG. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going now in about an hour to London. Here's where I'm staying. Here's the fax number. And I'd like a fax from you on your company's letterhead, Media Arts. I don't want it on Sochi 2014 because there is no Sochi 2014. You don't represent anybody. And when I land, I'd like to have a fax from you to me, from your company. And it says, you're hired for the next two years. Here's your scope of work. Here's how much you're going to pay. And if I don't get it, then I'll burn this. I'll burn it to the ground. I will put it in the trash. I'll take every file, destroy it. And you and IMG have 45 days to put a bid together and get it to the IOC. It's due in February. Good luck. So I landed and he did it. And Dima and I got along wonderfully for two years. I mean, I loaned, I had to loan them money to get their bid books printed. People always think, oh, those Russians, they had all this money and Putin was behind it. And they never were, they were never, they were always short on money. We literally were ready to go to press with the bid books and they were beautiful bid books in those days, expensive, crazy money. And we did the printing in, in the States. We didn't trust the print. I didn't know any printers in Russia because it had, you know, it's a coffee table, beautiful book, 200 bucks a copy or 250. I don't know what it was, but. They needed half the money up front or they wouldn't do it. And Dima called me and he says, there's no way I can get this money. There's no way I can get this foreign currency out of Russia to them in 24 hours or whatever it was they wanted. Would you pay it? And I promise you, I'll pay you back. And I, I said, I'm oh, sure I'll do it because I trusted him and I did it and they paid me back. And by the way, they did hire IMG and we got a lot of incremental business out of that bid because IMG didn't know what they were doing either because bidding is pretty unique and precise. So that's. That's how Sochi happened. Uh, I, I have a question on Sochi. Mm -hmm. So when you're bringing in all these Americans and you're doing all these things separate from this organizing committee, how do you reconcile that in terms of they really don't have an organizing committee? You're having all these problems with the Russian bid, and yet you're doing all these things to make the Russian bid happen. Yeah. I trusted the three individuals who, who gave me that bid. There were three guys with whom I worked in the Moscow bid. Dmitry Svatkovsky, who was gold medal modern pentathlete from Sydney, Dima, a guy named Alexei Sorokin, who became the head of the Russia 2018 bid and the CEO of the, the World Cup, and a guy named Alexander Chunov. And those were the three guys that, that I could relate to, that I worked with every day. And to a greater or lesser extent, Two out of the three were, were 
attached to security apparatus. And that's how it is in Russia. Everybody with whom I've ever worked who's in a decision-making role probably has more than one job description. So those guys said, we can't do a contract yet. We don't have any money yet, but I promise you this will get done. And interestingly enough, those three guys got cut out of the whole deal after it got going. They did get cut out. Those three guys were abandoned and went their own ways. They were not part of Sochi 2014, the guys who actually made it happen for me. I mean, I remember going down and visiting the mayor of Sochi and he had no idea who I was. He hadn't got the memo from Moscow. And he um, said something fairly disparaging in Russian that I could understand 30% of it. And the translator said, oh, the mayor's so happy to meet you, Mr. Burns. <laughs> That's not what he said. He's so happy to meet you, Mr. Burns, but he's busy. Can you go back to your hotel and we'll call you? They, they literally didn't know. So later they called and I went back. Oh, boy, brat, boy, brat, my brother, my brother. Everybody's happy. So, you know, I, I've been grilled about this. I've been eviscerated a little bit on Twitter about working for Sochi and for uh, the World Cup bid. And I, I, all I can say is it's not in my defense. It's, it's in my true belief. You know, those bids were respectively 17 and 15, 11 years ago. I, McDonald's, Coke, every brand you can think of on the planet, every country you can think of on the planet, literally thought we were helping Russia change. What better way than sport? And I spent a lot of time there and I was never treated with anything but kindness. My first stint there with, with Alta, I mean, I was by myself in 1992. I walked all over that city with more money in my pocket than people had making in a year. I got lost a thousand times. I got confused a million times. Every single time somebody would help me gladly. So I thought that there was a good chance that we could modernize Russia, not we, just the Olympics, but everything. I mean, I was there when, was there a year after McDonald's opened? I was there when all this stuff was opening, when, you know, the first Western brand would put a store in Goom and it was exciting and the world was changing and, and Russia was becoming a responsible member of the world community. And we were part of that. We were proud of that. And we were wrong. We were wrong. So... Am I sorry I did it? No. Am I sorry it failed? Immeasurably so. So that's, that's what I'll say about it. And people who have their own point of view and or ax to grind, that's not enough for them. Some of them on Twitter. And I don't care. You know, there was a moment there where we had an opportunity. We, the collective West, had an opportunity. And it didn't work for whatever reason. Whatever reason you believe. It didn't work. We were wrong. And here we are, people getting slaughtered. It's terrible. It's, it's extraordinarily depressing. So that was Sochi. And then 2018 was interesting. The Koreans called me immediately because they knew I'd worked for Sochi and they knew I'd worked for Vancouver, both of whom defeated Pyeongchang's first and second bid. And I once again cracked a knee on a motorcycle. And I went over, I remember I went over on crutches. I ride motorcycles off-road. Go across Alaska and never get on pavement. That's what we like to do. I don't like to ride on streets. People in trucks run over you on street. But you break things when you, you're still going slow. But if you I was going to say, it doesn't sound like you, you're, you're much safer off road. <laughs> you are. You're going slow, but you stay you alive. Or, yeah. <laughs> Nobody runs over you once you fall down, which is a good thing. So I went over to see him. And I remember it's classic Korea. It's me in a room with, 40 Koreans and a translator. Ah, Mr. Burns. Well, we're glad you're here. And we are going to, once again, focus on reuniting the Korean peninsula. And I just remember saying, well, then I, when's the next flight out of here? Because I'm going to go to work for Munich and beat you. They didn't understand why. And I said, look, the only reason people hire me is because I understand the target audience. You've got a message that you think resonates with the world. And it does. And peace on the Korean peninsula. It's important. Reunification, it's important geopolitically. Is it important to the people voting on the Olympic Games? You tell me, you've tried it twice. You lost to a city no one had ever heard of, a summer resort in Russia, and you lost to Vancouver because they had better stories. So we fought. I love, I like Korea a lot because they're very aggressive. Like you go to Japan, I love Japan, by the way, it's my favorite country in Asia, but you go to Japan and everybody's so nice and 
you think you hear what you want to hear and you don't know, and you get on the plane, you sit back and you go, wow, oh, there's the knife in my back. <laughs> but in Korea, you go into a business meeting, everybody's knives are on the table. And I like that. And they're super aggressive and combative. And I like it. So we fought and fought, 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 fought. So Chairman Cho, who owned Korean Air, ran that bid. And he's a princeling, you know, he's, he runs the Chai Bowl. He did. God rest his soul. He's now didn't. But he and I just did not hit it off at the beginning. He was used to deference and he would stand up and somebody would put his jacket on for him. And I just said, here's how this is going to work. My name's Terrence. Your name is YH. And that's what I'm going to call you. And you got to trust me. And I, I have been accused and it's, it's a fair accusation and it's probably cost me more than it's gotten me, but it's how I'm built. But in a bid, what they don't understand, you can have all the money in the world, but you don't have a lot of time and you can't buy time. If you lose one day in a bid, you don't get that back, unlike a business. So my job is to cut through the bullshit and focus on what matters. And sometimes you've got to have really sharp elbows. And sometimes you would bowl over people because my job is to help them win the games and not make friends and not listen to someone who truly has no idea what they're talking about and is truly wasting precious time. And those sharp elbows have to be deployed in the beginning. And then once you get their trust, then you don't need them anymore. So that's the way it was with me and Chairman Cho. to the point where I wrote a letter to be read at his eulogy the last day of the games in Pyeongchang. He was dying and he took me and several of the other consultants that worked on the bid just with him that day. We went around all day in his private car, went to the events that he wanted to go to, took us to dinner, lunch, excuse me. He wanted to be with us and he knew he was dying and I could tell he was deathly ill. He became a great friend. I, I, I struggled with him, with his English. He called me one time in the middle of the night and he said, have you seen King's speech? I said, what? He never knew what time it was. He would always call me at the wrong time. <laughs> he said, have you seen King's Speech? I said, King's Speech, King's Speech. You're talking about the movie with Colin Firth? He goes, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, I've seen it. He goes, ha ha, you and me, ha ha. And then he hangs up. But he, he did so terrible in one speech that I eviscerated him in a room full of all of his underlings, which you just don't do. It was this presentation to the EOC, European Olympic Council. One of our 11 presentations. He was terrible. He told me I was terrible because my wife was in the front row. I said, well, we're not inviting her anymore. And he literally took me aside. He said, the president of Korea asked me to do this. I do not want to be the reason we win. I don't need to do this. I'm a wealthy man. I have 10 companies to run. If you want me to sit on the stage and say not one word, that's what I'll do. I don't care. I don't need to speak. I've never heard a bid chairman in my entire experience not want to be a stage hog. They just all do. And that's my job as the foreigners to say, you sit down. No, you get one minute. You suck. You just sit there. They just kind of have to take it because you've got that store-bought credibility. And it really moved me that he said that. And I committed to him. I'm going to, I'm going to work with you. You're not going to sit on that stage. We need the chairman of Korean Air to stand up and say why you believe in this. But I did use Teresa Ra, who became my muse for that whole bit. And then I started writing for her. She's just extraordinary communicator. And I, I told him, I said, look, I've got, I got seven Korean old dudes in suits and six of you been in jail and none of you can speak English. What am I supposed to do with that? I'm turning this whole thing around. You're going to be hip. You're going to be cool. We're going to have a woman speak. We just changed it all. And we're going to call this new horizons. And here's the reason why you're going to bring winter sport to Asia for the first time since Sapporo. So, you know, that really worked. We had a story. There's no way we should have beaten Munich. Munich had everything. It's a beautiful city. It's a winter sports capital. Pyeongchang was nothing. You went there. But we had a story. And that story was so good that even Bach started saying things like, well, you can't always be thinking about New Horizons. You've got to replenish the roots. That became their message. Then I knew we'd beat them. I knew we had beaten them. And he got really mad after it and said, you know, these damn consultants. I said, you're just mad because you hired the wrong one. You know, laugh, laughing at him. I do think that was the beginning of the end for the old bid process. But he had to know that he could have you at the presidency or 2018, but not both. Anyway, so Pyeongchang was very, very satisfying. It was a soup to nuts, completely changing their entire approach. And they let me and trusted me. And it was very personal for me. My father fought there in the war as a young boy. And it, 
it changed his life being in Korea. He'd never been out of his little town in Tennessee, never been out of the county. They were poor and going to Korea. He'd always say to me, son, hardest working people in the world. I've never seen anything like it. And the two years he was there just changed it. Then he was dead. So anyway, that was important. That was an important bid for me emotionally. And we were able to help them. Our team were able to help them. And then 2020, I was being feted by everybody, almost went to Istanbul. Here's, you asked the question, Allison, I had two good offers, Istanbul and Rome. Rome was a lot more risky politically, which proved to be right. But I said, man, I've just spent 10 days out of every month for the last two years in Korea. I'm exhausted. What if I could go to somewhere like Rome and just eat pasta for the next two years and drink great red wine? And then I said, boom, it's Rome. And um, I love that bid we wrote there. We did about six months and then they pulled the bid. Professor Monte came in as their new PM and killed it. The day we were delivering the, the application file, well, he waited to that day. So then Baku called and I did that for a few months. I got whacked. And then Madrid called and I did those. I did Madrid for their last six months. And I liked that one too. I enjoyed working with, who's now the King Felipe, one of the nicest men I've ever met. One of the most genuine royalty and or scion or giant of the world I've ever met. Very personable. I remember going out to his private residence, me and a young lady named Ansley O'Neill, who worked for me at the time. Ansley and I are in his little study at his house. It's a beautiful royal residence outside of the city to sit down and work with him on his speeches. Then I wrote them all and I said, I'm an American. So that means genetically, I'm not disposed to even remotely understanding how to address you. <laughs> what am I supposed to call you? And he said, my name's Felipe. Your name's Terrence. That's what we call each other in here. And so what about when we're outside of this room? He said, it's confusing to me. So just do what everybody else does. And he laughed. I thought it was wonderful. Another great little thing about him. And I, you know, you work late, late into night on these presentations. We have a presentation at nine in the morning and we're still up at two redoing the slides. And he's sitting there with us. And I had a kid, one of the, we had designers from Spain who I love those guys. I still use them. But one of them was a dude. It was very anti everything. We're sitting there working and he'd been a little distant with Felipe was the heir apparent then. He was Prince. He wasn't the king yet, but I think his name was Jose. Jose had intimated that he wasn't a monarchist and blah, blah, blah. So we're sitting there working. It's about two in the morning and Felipe walks into our work room. They all, we all stand up. Jose just keeps working. So Felipe goes over and goes, well, what are you working on there? That's just beautiful what you're doing there. And it was, their work was incredible. He told him, he's kind of like, future king's talking to me you could sit you could see him crumbling a little bit so felipe says you guys got to be tired does, does anybody need something to drink and thinking you know he snap his fingers and so jose says i'd like a coke so felipe goes over cracks open a coke puts ice in it pours it brings it back to him and jose says can i have my picture made with you <laughs> it's those little things and there's just a million stories like that for every bit those little things so it just goes on um 22, I tried Lviv, it blew up just because friends of me, like Sergey Bukka calls you and says, will you help me? What are you going to do? Say no to Sergey. So I did it. It blew up. And then friends of mine called me and asked me if I could help Almaty. I'd never been to Kazakhstan. Another reason I'd like to see Kazakhstan. I'll take it. I went and we almost won. If we'd had six more months, we would have won. So that's how those things go. LA, first one I went to was Boston. Didn't want to do it. Told the people with whom I worked, I don't want to do it. I thought American bids were, they had always been tone deaf and terrible. And Boston, I could tell like the first week that it was going to happen. And four months, three months later, it blew up. I was asked to go to, to LA, didn't want to do it. Talked to Casey, had a great, nice phone conversation. He said, you're hired. I said, well, first I want to meet you and spend some time with you because this is incredibly emotional what we're going to do for me. And I need to know if we're going to get along. So I went and met him and he was charming and funny and all those things. So. That's how that happens. And the secret to my modest success in the Olympics, I think is I understood working with George in the beginning, George was very generous teaching me about the values of the Olympics. I mean, I hired George and his partner, Brad, to work on my Atlanta sponsorship for Delta. And that's where I met George and his enthusiasm for the values and what it was all, what it all meant 
is infectious if you aren't a cynic. And George is a lot of things and are all wonderful, but most of all, he's not a cynic. He's, he's a believer. And so I learned a lot from George on storytelling and what the Olympics meant. And then I realized that the bidding process was about telling stories. It was about making people love you and the hair stand up on their arms in the back. So to me, it became a branding and a messaging exercise, not a technical exercise. And I must have been onto something because we did pretty well bidding. And I think the dark side of that is if you're really good and sophisticated at that, sometimes cities that win maybe shouldn't have won. And sometimes cities that should have won don't win. There's a lot of politics that go on behind bidding. Ladies that I, I don't pretend to know, I've never done lobbying. I don't do that. I don't sit in the bar at the Beau Rivage and talk to IOC members about my job is to do what I do, create the brand, create the messaging, manage all the external communications, do the presentation, set the strategy, but I'm not going to go talk to Juanito about why you should vote for Pyeongchang. Just, he's a friend and that's where you, I think friendship was crossed into business and I don't want to do that. And I think it's kind of useless to have a third party bidding on behalf of the city. It makes no sense for me as an American to lobby on behalf of Pyeongchang. It looks like I'm a hired gun. And I am a hired gun to some extent, but not not in that particular role. And I'm not denigrating people who do it. It's just something I'm not comfortable doing. I don't know how to do it, and I don't do it. So there's a political aspect. You know, is it geographical rotation? You have to be a deal. More often than not, it's do they like you? Do they trust you? Then you're halfway home. You really are halfway home. Have you put in the effort to communicate with them, not just in the presentations, but at all the events that happen throughout the Olympic calendar, et cetera? It's just a lot to it. So to pretend that me or just what I do is key to winning Olympic bids is, is fatuous. It's wrong. Winning Olympic bid is an equation with 20 variables in it. They're all weighted differently, but they're there. You have to put some weight to all of them. But if you don't have a story, you're not going to win. But you can have a story and still lose. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask about your target audience and mm -hmm. not just creating stories. And yes, you did not lobby. But, you know, when you look at the target audience and how it changed over the course of mm -hmm. your time in the, as George called it, the golden era of bidding, you're dealing with three different presidents of the IOC, which probably set three different tones. So how does, how did your audience change over time? And how did you change your approach over time when you took on a bid? I made the assumption that when we walked into that room on the final day, excuse me, I made the assumption always that 85% of the people have made up their minds. There might be 15% of the people in that room that I could swing a vote. We, not I, we, the team. And I think I was right. Pyeongchang won 63 votes to 25. That's, that's a little more than a 15% swing. But, you know, China, the first voting round, I've heard that we tied them. The second round of voting, we lost by three votes. So it doesn't get down to targeting IOC individuals specifically for me. But as a group of people, they're there to choose an Olympic Games host city. And they're all human beings. I've had IOC members I know saying, hey, Terrence, who are you representing today? And I'll tell them, oh, I didn't even know they were bidding on the day of the vote. So you can't assume that they know anything about your city. You can't assume that they've seen you present. In the old days, they would have seen, or a lot of them would have seen you present in various presentations. I mean, honestly, Pyeongchang, we did 11 presentations around the world in two years. So you can't assume anything. So I tailor it to what I think they need to hear during that bid race and what the issues are surrounding the cities and what I think is important to the members themselves. And that I realize that that sounds arrogant. It's not meant to be, but it's, it's a best guess. For example, the last one I worked on was Stockholm 26. Very frustrating. And I'm on record for saying it was frustrating. They obviously finally had a Nordic city at the table. Finally finally had a city that could maybe replicate a little of the Lillehammer magic. That certainly is what I tried to do with its positioning and with the film we made on with $12 and a, and a rusty bone. You know, the Swedes, they're not going to spend much money and they weren't going to spend much money on the bid, but we got through it. And the IOC worked with them diligently for months to try to create a, 
acceptable alternative to the host city contract and guarantees. And they finally got to something that everybody agreed was feasible. It wasn't the guarantees that Milan Cortina finally signed, but they were told in my memory up until the end that it's okay. We understand that this is, this is different in Sweden and Scandinavia, and maybe we need to be more flexible on our side to understand how to do this. So more cities in Western Europe will bid on games. Then suddenly you have Italy that says, oh, we'll sign anything. So the new norm became the old norm. And I was sitting there in Lausanne and I heard the coordination evaluation commission make its presentation before we went on and literally eviscerate us. I used to say the, the guarantees were not good. I'm sorry, but that's not what we've been led to believe. Let's put it that way. We were big fans of the Stockholm bid. And uh, we're in the green room. I'm with the prime minister of Sweden. You just got smoked, bro. You just got run over by a truck. And the Swedes, you know, are so nice and almost naive. And what? I said, it, it's, it's over. So I sat down with the, the chairman of Volvo. I had one speech for some guy. I can't even remember what he ran. A part of the Nobel committee. And we're 30 minutes to show to him. I pulled him, created another speech in his time slot for the Volvo guy to get up and talk about what guarantees mean in Sweden that our word is our bond. When has Sweden ever defaulted on anything? Look at our economy. Look at our socioeconomic system. And I was trying to not say it, but slightly juxtapose it with our competitor. I see had what they needed from Italy. They made a decision. So they're right. They had all the guarantees that they've always had. So to me, the message that was sent there was all the creativity that the Swedes tried to apply all the negativity that they overcame in Sweden from the populace who had a very definitive view, not on the Olympics, but on the IFC. It's all for naught. So, you know, you win some, you lose some. And that was an exciting bid. We, just, we were going to do the sliding over in, in Latvia. I mean, it was, it was the right bid at the right time. And I think that Sweden's humanitarian brand and values would have helped the Olympic brand in a lot of ways. And I think they could have in injected a lot of Nordic magic into the winter brand, the Olymp winter games brand, which is a struggling brand, both in relevance, viewership, and now with the climate. So that was a disappointing one. Uh, I always say this, if you lose, you need to look in the mirror because that's the only thing you can control. Only thing that we could control is how we did what we did. So we lost. So we can blame that or this or home or them or whatever. Look in the mirror. What didn't we do well enough that we should have? That's how I feel when I'm with a bid that loses. And it's easy for people in bids to say, we lost because they did this and they did that, or they had money or didn't sue or whatever. You can't control any of that. You just lost because they had a better bid. That's what I say. And it's painful, but it's true. Are you working on any 2030 bids? I'm discussing with some people, but that's going to be an interesting one. Japan, economically, going back to Asia, just from my point of view, is not the best commercial decision for the movement and its commercial stakeholders, simply because Tokyo and Beijing underperformed. I'm sorry, but they did from the commercial perspective, not from sport, but from the sponsors and broadcasters. Yeah, they were. They were muted games. So are you going to go back to Japan? And are the Japanese people, are they kind of have an Olympic hangover? I don't know. You get Vancouver. They had it in 2010. I did that bid. I worked on that bid with George. They did a great job. Smaller market. You got Salt Lake, who on paper looks perfect, but it's complicated with LA two years prior. So their promotional window, if you figure, just, just say it's go backwards and say it's a standard seven-year window. Their promotional period went from seven years to two years. Their fundraising period ostensibly would have to be conducted along with LA, but I can tell you that organizing committees like LA or summer ones, they're selling right up to the last minute. And the US OPP is the entity that would be selling both of those games at the same time. And I'm not sure that Salt Lake would be a priority for that entity. But from what I understand, Salt Lake's budget is solid. It's very fiscally conservative. They think they can raise the money 
that they need and sponsorship revenue almost in Utah. So it's an interesting conundrum. So, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to 30. 34 is interesting. Thomas has said he's not going to do a dual award. And I have to believe him since he went out of his way to say it. I understand why takes that responsibility away from the next president or honor or opportunity, or however one wants to describe it. And if Salt Lake thinks they want to wait for 34, I don't know. What if a city in Northern Europe comes back again? Even though you got Melonix Cortina in, in 26, you know, the IRC always loves winter games in Northern Europe. So it, it's a tough one, but I think that the new bidding process is smart. It's certainly something that it's similar to something I've advocated a long time and in writing. I think they need to not make it a beauty contest. It needs to have much more objective assessment of these cities. They need to work with them. I've always said that Olympic brand management really begins when you choose a host city. That is the embodiment of the Olympic brand, the city and the games that take place in that. I mean, it doesn't get any more basic than that. So if you pick a problematic place, you see what happens to the brand. So I always thought that they should look two cycles out. They should say, let's look at the fundamental principles of the Olympic Charter, which says that we should place the Olympic Games at the service of sport or service of man everywhere. The word everywhere is important. Where can the Olympic movement be and best fulfill its destiny? And once you look at that, then, okay, that's all great, but which one of those cities can really do this? And if one can't, but you still want to be there, why not go to that city, which is what they're doing, and say, let's talk about you hosting the games in 10 years or eight years or whatever, and let's get you prepared and help you understand what it takes to be. If you want to do it, fine. If you don't, fine. But if you do, we can at least help you be prepared. We're not guaranteeing you'll get it, but here, here's what you need at the bare minimum to bid on the Olympic Games. And we'd sure like to have an Olympic Games in your region or your country or whatever. To me, that's brand management rather than the dog and pony show and the beauty contest that it was when I was really doing it for a living. Do you think that the IOC learned something from putting a host city in Rio? Because that was a move into South America, but that was problematic games. I think it was a big boy moment for them. I think if you look at what FIFA has done, FIFA puts their money when they you know went to South Africa, they made a statement. They knew the cost would be great, but it was worth it. So I think to answer your question about Rio, there's two pieces to it. Did they learn a lesson? Oh, yeah, I'm sure they did. I think relying on economic indicators and promises from politicians seven years out from an event is a kind of a backwards way to do it. And that bit them a little bit. I think they knew what they were getting into in terms of the stability or lack thereof or the economic veracity or the lack thereof of the Brazilian market. I think they wanted to make a geopolitical statement. They wanted to show their support for South America, and I'm glad they did. And um, I'm sure it exhausted the staff. I know it did. But you took to the games to a place it's never been before. And I think you don't measure the efficacy of an Olympic Games impact in a few years. It takes a long time. Interestingly enough, and sadly enough, one of the guys that I wrote speeches for in the Sochi bid, who's now in the Duma, and it's not Dima, he's my age. And I sat down with him. I was trying to figure out what to write for him. You know, I typically approach it. I know what I want him to say, but I want to hear them tell me some things too. But I have to script it. It's a play. You know, it's got seven actors and there's a thread of continuity. And I can't just let everybody say, this is what I want to say because it won't work. But anyway, I wanted to get some background. And he said, when the Moscow games came, I was a student and I was a volunteer. And one of my job, one of the things I did was I, I poured cement for the Dinamo, the stadium. It was one of the stadiums they built for the games, Dinamo, the soccer stadium. And um, he said, I was 22 or whatever. And he said, we just, we had never seen all these foreigners and we couldn't help but notice that these foreigners who weren't of the Soviet system, especially the Westerners, they weren't poor. We were told that they were poor. They had great shoes and clothes and their teeth were nice. They had good glasses. And he said, for someone of my generation, that was in 1980. He said, I think that's when Glasnost and Perestroika began. That's when the subtle, so many Russians in Moscow saw so many foreigners for the first time in their lives. And it, he just said it as an offhand comment. And it took me years to think about it in a broader construct. 
That's why you can't measure the e efficacy of a games quickly. The Soviet Union didn't fall until 1991, 11 years later. So it takes time. And the impacts of the games in Rio may not be immediate, but I think they're there. As long as the IOC understood what the price is, and you know, I was there, you were there, those were tough games. But they made a decision to go there, and they followed through for it, through it, and they made it happen. Thank you so much, Terrence. You can follow Terrence at tburnsports.com. He also has terrencehburnsblog.com. And on that blog, he's got some really in-depth stories about a couple of the bids he's worked on. They're really fascinating. You can follow him on Twitter at tburnsports. We'll have links to those in the show notes. Terrence also has an opinion on whether or not the Middle East should host a games. And he wrote that opinion in sportsbusiness.com. And we'll have a link to that as well. I have no doubt Terrence has an opinion. <laughs> that sound means it's time for our history moment. And all year long, we've been focusing on Albertville 1992, as it is the 30th anniversary of those Winter Olympics. My turn for a story. Yes. And you have been promising me espionage. I have promised you espionage, and I have promised you a color puke explosion. So we will start with that. And this is a little quick aside because it's really based on a video I saw, which I will post the, a link to the video in the show notes as well. Because this is really kind of amazing. We're still in, we're back to bobsled. This is bobsled story part two. The unified team uniforms. So this is the countries that used to be the Soviet Union. Oh my goodness. <laughs> These uniforms have random different color blocks on them and different places and sometimes they look like stripes and that yeah you know what i'm talking about 92 style the colors are teal bright pink yellow light blue white and black and to top it off yes the bobsledders are wearing red helmets <laughs> teal the only color that could survive in the 92 <laughs> olympics <laughs> But one thing about the helmet situation is I noticed it today when I was watching the video again. There's an equipment evolution that happens because everybody's got the big almost motorcycles helmet on that they've got now. So it's it's a big helmet, covers your head, covers your chin area. But today people wear face shields. And back then the three pushers were wearing nothing. And then the driver wore goggles. And his goggles were bright pink, too. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> anyway, one of the runs on this unified team's bobsled has a disaster start because the number two man slips while he's trying to jump into the sled. And, I, and they're going around a turn at the same time. So you don't get a clear angle of what is going on, but you just see him slipping. And then it's just like everyone's trying to get into the sled. Somehow he made it in, but he's backwards the whole way down. You do not want to be looking at one of your teammates in a bobsled. No, not at all. But I will definitely post that in the show notes. So take a look. It's it's pretty amazeballs. But on to the espionage, which is the star of this, this week's story. So it's 1992, as you remember. Germany's competing as one country for the first time in decades. And German officials had to work to hold the team together at this point, because it was discovered by a Dresden newspaper that at least one member of the German team was a Stasi informant. This was the East German secret police. A lot of people in East Germany spied on their friends and relatives and neighbors for the police. A lot of bad stuff happened because of that. And this Stasi informant was first-time Olympic bobsled driver and one of the favorites at Albertville, Harold Schudai. And he became an informant for the Stasi after police caught him driving while intoxicated. And that's how they'd get a lot of people. They'd arrest him for something and say, well, you can get out of it if you become an informant for us. So he chose the informant route. And the AP reported that as an informer, he wrote at least 10 reports about his teammates and officials from the Dynamo Bobsled Club, which was in Altenburg. And Altenburg is one of the, the tracks on the World Cup circuit. He did that for two years from 88 to 90 and only stopped because the East German country fell apart and the Stasi also was dissolved as well. So a New York Times report by Stephen Kinzer said Harold's reports focused on personal lives and political opinions. And although he didn't know how the information was used, he believed that they caused no harm. So huge deal in Germany. 
big uproar just countrywide about who had collaborated with the Stasi. And Chudai was the first member of the Olympic team to be outed. So it was a shock to his teammates, Tino Bonk, Axel Young, and Alexander Shelig. But they got it. They understood. They supported him. And it, it also helped that Chudai also apologized profusely to his teammates. So they made it work. Still, the German National Olympic Committee has to investigate the case and figure out whether he should compete. Who is deciding Shudai's fate? German Olympic Committee President Willy Dauma, who was also the head of Munich 1972. His Secretary General, Walter Troger, Torger. Klaus Kotter, who is the president of the German Bobsled and Luge Federation. And one Thomas Bach, a German member of the IOC. Wow. That was not where I thought you were going with that story. <laughs> I know. It's was... really interesting because at the time, you know, the whole idea of who worked with and for the Stasi was a huge issue with the reunification. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that I had any personal knowledge, but I just remember being in the news, the whole idea of I can't work with this person because they informed on their neighbors. And it was so pervasive in East German society. You know, and the, and the Stasi were no joke. I mean, we make jokes about the KGB, but th this was so seeped into every pore of East German society that to have been a Stasi informant wasn't funny. <laughs> no. All. And and of course, you have people like Katerina Witt, who also insisted that she was not a Stasi informant, but she was very pro-communist and very good, like, friend of the government, so to speak, because she she did a lot of stuff with them. Right. And she certainly was a, I don't want to say a, a, a prop of the regime, but she was certainly a poster child that they showed saying, look at how wonderful East German sports is. Look at this beautiful girl. So this was not a simple question. And so interesting that Thomas Bach yet again comes back in these pieces, you know, played such a role in 1980, played such a role. And then, of course, now is Papa T. Bach. There you go. Takes care of everything. <laughs> it reminds you of what generation he is. It does. And it also reminds you how people work their way up a system as well. It's all very fascinating when, when you see these names pop up again and again throughout history. So this committee decided to let Ch Shudai compete. They did ask all the Olympic athletes and coaches to admit Stasi connections, but they also seemed to understand what the East German system was like and that people may have been coerced into this role. And even Juan Antonio Samaranch advised, as Kinzer wrote, you should look ahead and not instead of back. Needless to say, this whole event was really stressful on Shudai. And although he was a favorite for gold, officials started saying it would be amazing if they meddled at all. And sadly, he did not live up to early expectations and the team finished sixth. But Harold and his teammate, Alexander Scheilig, still stayed together. They added two other teammates, and at Lillehammer in 94, they won gold. And then he went on to drive for one more Olympics at Nagano, and he finished eighth there. Shudai went on to have a short coaching career. He coached the Dutch women's team at Torino 2006. And now he runs fitness studios with the bobsled trainer, Gerd Leopold, who trained him back in Albertville. And notably, and you will love this, his son, Alexander, won gold in the boys' monobob at the 2020 Winter Youth Olympic Games. I'm so overwhelmed right now. <laughs> I'm still stuck on T-Bach being on this <laughs> Oh, and you know, I wonder what 1992 T-Bach looked like because the sideburns and the stash would have been gone. Yeah, that's a good question. We'll find a picture to post yes. of what yes. T-Bach looked in the day. Exactly. So we may look to find another shoot eye in the Olympics at some point. Welcome to Shook Plus Don. It is the time of the show where we check in with our team, Keep the Flame Alive. These are past guests of the show who now make up our citizenship of Shook Plus Don, our very own country, checking in with results. Yeah, so Jenny Fuchs has now become a professional boxer, and she is 2-0 and as a pro. And this was the bout that was delayed because of the death of Queen Elizabeth, and she won the six-round match against Gemma Ruge. 
And in other Shuklastan news, Claire Egan will be inducted into the Maine Sports Hall of Fame on October 30th. Evan Dunphy's election results from Richmond came in this week, and unfortunately he came close, but he did not win his bid for the city council. Paralympian John Register is the cover story on the fall 2022 issue of Diverse Ability magazine. And Kelly Chang has a new partner in her most recent competition, or I should say a new old partner. So she's back again competing this time with Sarah Hughes, which is who she started with back at the beginning of the Tokyo cycle. So we'll see where that goes. We have some upcoming competitions, too. Aaron Jackson is going to compete in the U.S. Speed Skating Long Track Fall World Cup Qualifier and Am Cup 1. That is this week, Thursday through Saturday. She's in the 500, 1,000, and 1,500 meters. You can watch that on U.S. Speed Skating's YouTube channel. John Schuster is competing with Team Schuster in Grand Prairie, Alberta at the Hearing Life Tour Challenge, which started on October 18th and runs through October 23rd. Right now, he's 0-1 in round robin action, obviously very early in the competition. Uh, You can watch it live on Sportsnet, Sportsnet 1, or Sportsnet 360, and stream the action on SN Now. And also, we are in the process of choosing official elements for Shukvastan. So if you are in our Facebook group, look for polls. Allison, you have posted the first one of these. What are we looking for now? Yes. So right now we are choosing Shuklastan official flower. So we are choosing between the flame lily, the torch lily, and the lotus vine, which even though it does not have a flame reference name, the buds look like um, a whole bunch of flames. Very cool. So there are pictures pictures in the Facebook group and it's pinned to the top. So you just go in there and, and it is very close right now. Well, I'm excited. So vote by the end of October and we will have more polls coming out soon because there are many things we need to choose about Shuklastan. We have some news from Paris 2024. This is exciting. This is what a lot of people have been wondering about, how to volunteer. And that information came out this week. So they're looking for about 45,000 volunteers you have to be 18 plus on or before January 1st, 2024. Require that you speak either English or French. Volunteer stints will be at least 10 days long and they will take place between July and September of 2024. So you can be from anywhere in the world, just as long as you meet those requirements. You have to join Le Club, like you have to do for everything. The application portal will open March 2023, and it's going to be open for about six to eight weeks. And then starting in September 2023, candidates will be notified whether or not they've been selected or, as Olympics.com said, assigned a volunteer mission. And the, the criteria are very clear. It sounds like the portal is going to be very simple. And once again, with everything else, with Paris 2024, it's based from Le Club. So they are making information very easy to find and very clear. You join the club, you get the information. That's all you need to know, basically. The information will come to you in French. Google but... Translate. <laughs> Though you have to be careful because Google Translate sometimes will make siren into mermaid. Ooh, that's very different. And I can Just see that happening. For the mermaid when there is a fire. <laughs> and And I can see that being a big problem when we're talking about Olympic or Paralympic stuff, right? (laughs) Right. So when they talk about, you know, danger, danger, listen for the mermaid. It doesn't (laughs) quite have the same, it doesn't quite have the same impact. (laughs) When we were in Beijing and we saw all that fire equipment, it would have been a lot less scary if they had mermaids painted on it. True. So let us know if you apply to volunteer. We would love to hear what the portal experience is like. We'd love to know if you get called for assignment and what you get to do. We've talked about volunteer gigs extensively from Beijing. So you do all sorts of stuff like help athletes. You make the sports run. You help manage transportation. You work with the media in the venues and in the press center to make sure that their lives run a little bit more smoothly. So it's all very interesting work in different ways. Occasionally you have to haul me up a mountain. (laughs) Bless those two little girls. I hope they are doing well. 
But yeah, it's it's a really re- rewarding experience. So many people have said so. We would love if one of you or many of you got volunteer gigs. That's going to do it for this week. So I, I do want to know, what do you think of the golden years of bidding? And is this new bid process, which is supposedly less transparent, say some detractors, do you think it's a good idea? And you can let us know through email at flamealivepod at gmail.com. You can call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. Our social handle is at Flame Alive Pod, And be sure to join the Keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook and pick a flower. Next week, we hope you'll be flipping over our guest where we scheduled to record an interview later this week. And we'll share it with you on next week's show. But as we like to say, it doesn't happen till it happens. So we're not going to share necessarily who that is yet. We're dropping Easter eggs like Taylor Swift. There you go. (laughs) All right. Hope you're picking them all up. So thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive.